Hey everyone, how's it going? So I've actually been planning this video for years. Since after playing Red and Blue with Magikarp, I was convinced this would be one of the next hardest challenges. And uh, it potentially could be. Of course, we're talking about beating Pokemon Platinum with just a Shedinja. Now, Shedinja is a very unique Pokemon. Looking at its stats, you'll notice that its HP is base 1. That's not even necessarily true. Its HP is 1. Always. It literally only has 1 HP. Which would probably make a run impossible if not for its ability, Wonder Guard. Wonder Guard only allows super effective moves to hit. However, Shedinja is a bug ghost type, and that gives it tons of things it's weak to. On the bug side, it's weak to fire, flying, and rock. And on the ghost side, it's weak to ghost and dark. This gives us protection over roughly two-thirds of the damaging moves. That's not exact, because I know not every type has equal number of moves, but that is a rough estimate. That being said, the moves we are weak to will knock us out in a single hit, in addition to stuff like confusion and poison. So this run is going to be very tricky, eventually. You may notice that for now, it's really easy because at the beginning of the game, most Pokemon only know normal moves, normal not affecting Shedinja, I mean regardless because it's a ghost type, but because of Wonder Guard. You may also notice Shedinja's attacks do a lot of damage. Well, going back to its stats, base 90 is pretty decent, and none of the other stats other than special attack really matter, and that's pretty abysmal, but its speed at base 40, that's not great. The maximum it could ever be is 196, meaning it's possible we could be outsped and that would be really problematic, but hopefully that doesn't happen. And there is a way that we can help ensure it doesn't, and it's somewhat necessary, because there is a rather big problem coming up. For whatever reason, until Generation 5, there was a conscious decision that the first gym leader needed to be a rock type and Roark is no exception. However, unlike Brock in Red and Blue, Roark's Pokemon know rock moves. And even though they can miss, yeah, Shedinja doesn't really stand much of a chance. Now, we should probably look at what moves Shedinja will have to help us with these rock Pokemon. The answer is not many. Scratch, Leech Life, Fury Swipes? Yikes. The most helpful move, Confuse Ray, we don't get till after level 30. Are we gonna have to level up that high? Well, I surely hope not, because Shedinja is part of the Erratic level up group. This group is by far the slowest to level up in the early game and the fastest in the late game. However, generally speaking, you need to level up more in the early game because of roadblocks like Roark. So, it's going to take us much longer than otherwise. And you might notice I have animations on. I haven't had animations on ever in a run. Decided it would be fun to try one with animations. Besides, they look really good on the DS. First Gen 4 run. And we still haven't gone anywhere close to beating the first gym leader. So, what are we going to do? Thankfully, just north of Orenboro City, there are two Pokemon that are awesome. Those are Machop and Ponyta. Now in Generation 3 and beyond, the way stats increased is through the EV system. We've talked about this before. Machop give you attack EVs and Ponyta give you speed EVs. And considering every other stat on Shedinja is practically useless, those are the best ones we could hope for. Now Machop appears more frequently, which is kind of good for EVs, but Ponyta gives you a ton of experience points. And after I level up a bit, I try Roark again. And I lose again. Unlike other runs, we know whether we're going to lose or not very quickly because it's a 1 KO. That's why I call my Shedinja Oko or 1 KO. Because either we're going to 1 KO or we're going to lose. And so I battled Roark a lot, probably over 50 times. The battles go very quickly. And basically, I discovered what I needed to do in order to win. Now, the higher you level up, the more and more consistent this will get. I wanted a good balance between consistency and not leveling to level 100 before the first gym. And so that took me to level 30, and here's the strategy. 
against the Geodude, we need one of two things to happen. Return comes very close to 1 KOing Geodude, and I either need Rock Throw to miss, or return itself to crit. If I level up more, Geodude would be a 1 KO. Cranidos? Cranidos? I have no idea. Once we get past Gen 3, I stop knowing how to pronounce Pokemon, because I never watched the anime past then. Anyway, it's a 1 KO, so that's not a problem, but Onix will be a 2 KO unless they get a crit. So once again, we either need a critical hit from Return, or an attack miss. So with all these luck components, our current chance of success is a mere 1%, give or take. So, yeah, not the best odds, but it's not as bad as you think, because the Geodude's right at the beginning, and it's so quick just to reset. And further to that point, level 30 is intentional, because this is the first level where Cranidos is always a 1 KO. At earlier levels, it was most of the time 1 KO, but you really just don't want more luck involved. And eventually I had a battle where I got a critical hit, that is a 6.25% chance of happening. Won a KO, the Cranidos with return. And then I got the 10% chance of a miss with Rock Throw. And so the odds of this exact battle happening again would be 1 in 160, but there were other options anyway. We finally win. I should note a couple things. We get return right at the beginning of the game, and that's really helpful. While at the beginning, Scratch is actually better, since we've been leveling up so much, our friendship is pretty high and Return does even more damage than Leech Life, which isn't resisted, and gets the same type bonus, so that's pretty cool. And the second thing to note is that in Diamond and Pearl, in Jubilife City, you actually get Hidden Power, and if we reset enough, we could get Hidden Power, Water, or Grass, and while Return ended up being pretty helpful, that would allow Rourke to be pretty easy. Probably would require some level of grinding, but not too much. Anyway, now that we're at level 30, there isn't all that much that can stand in our way. In Platinum, Gardenia does not actually have any move whatsoever that can affect Shedinja, so we can use whatever moves we want, don't have to worry about when it KOing or not, a little annoyed that the Turtwig setup reflects, but what can you do? And definitely a very different Gym Leader experience than our previous one. But, before you start relaxing, there is a trainer that we can lose to, and we do! Commander Jupiter in Eterna. So Commander Jupiter is not someone we're going to focus too much on, but they do have a Skunk Tank, and Return does not quite knock it out. Looking at Shedinja's moveset, it does get some useful moves, but as of right now, there's really nothing better than Return. So, to beat Jupiter, we could either level up or go for Confuse Ray, hope it hits itself in Confusion, but unfortunately even that won't knock out Skunk Tank, but it uses its Citrus Berry and then hits itself in Confusion again. So, the odds of beating Skunk Tank? About 25%. Not amazing odds, but hey, it's better than leveling up. And thankfully, as time goes on, we will get more and more options, and so we won't have to rely on as much luck. And while we're on the topic of Pokemon that give us issues, Youngster Donny in the Hearth Home Gym? Well, he has a Drifloon. And Drifloon has the ability Aftermath. Aftermath deals damage, which in our case, knocks us out, when a contact move is used to knock out the Pokemon. Unfortunately, at this point, all of Shedinja's moves, yes, all of them, are contact moves. We will really later on learn Shadow Ball, but thankfully, in the case of Youngster Donny, we can just not battle him. The gym leader Fantina, however, presents a new problem. She has a Duskull with Shadow Sneak, a priority move. So even though I outspeed Duskull by a lot, it has priority. Fortunately, I'm very close to level 38 even now, and at level 38, Shedinja also learned Shadow Sneak. And it turns out Rourke didn't really matter, because we would have to level up to 38 anyway to make Fantina possible. But with Shadow Sneak, since we are faster, we can easily use it to knock out Duskull. It'll even want to KO Miss Magus. And Haunter never stood a chance. So that's three gym badges, but more importantly, we are going to get the TM for Shadow Claw. As it's going to turn out, most of the best moves Shedinja can learn are learnt via TM. Now, those of you familiar with Generations 1 through 3 may think all ghost moves are physical attacks, but this is no longer true. Now, 
moves are divided by kind of how they work. So Shadow Ball is a special move, while Shadow Claw is the best physical type ghost move that Shedinja could learn. It's only base 70 power, which really sucks. However, it has a high critical hit ratio, which in this game means 12.5%, which in Generation 1 terms is awful. But that's about as good as we're going to get. So we can head to Veilstone. <laughs> no, we can't. Literally blocking our path is Rival 3. Now, I know I've skipped the first two battles because they really didn't matter. But here, he has a Staravia. And he will have a Staravia slash Staraptor for the rest of the game. And they both have the Intimidate ability, which lowers my attack. And because of that attack drop, we're just missing out on knocking out the Staravia. I could opt for Confuse Ray strats, but we still aren't able to 1 KO the Monferno, so I decided it was just easier to level up. Now, this did happen in my Ditto run in Emerald, and we were able to get a White Herb. Unfortunately, that is just not practical in this game. The White Herb is viable in the Battle Frontier, which is the post game, and while it is pick upable, you need a Pokemon at level 41, which we wouldn't have access to now anyway. And since the rules state we can only use Shedinja in battle, to level up a Pokemon to level 41 would require to put them in the daycare and run around a whole bunch. And it's just easier to level up, even if that were an option. We can't even access the daycare yet anyway. But once we level up, the battle is pretty much free. I say pretty much because you do have to use Confuse Ray against Monferno. But hey, 50-50 odds, much better than some of the battles we've had so far. And now, smooth sailing onto Veilstone, right? <laughs> no. No, not at all. And the reason why? We have to beat Ace Trainer Dennis. Now, Ace Trainer Dennis leads off with Gligar. And although it's the wrong color, it's not too big a problem. But then, Driftblim. And there is no way I can knock this thing out. Seriously, at this point, my moves are Shadow Claw, which is a contact move, Shadow Sneak, which is a contact move, Confuse Ray, it would take eight of which to knock out Driftblim, Return, and oh, by the way, Driftblim has Ominous Wind and Gust. So it can easily 1 KO my Shedinja if it attacks. So we're stuck. And this annoyed me a lot because in Veilstone, there are multiple TMs and other things I could do to make this workable. But unfortunately, I thought long and hard because the last thing I wanted to do was level up to level 59 to beat Ace Trainer Dennis. But alas, that is the only way for me to get past at this point. I say at this point because if I'd thought ahead, Perhaps I could have saved Leech Life and combined that with Confuse Ray. So long as the Confusion knocked out Drift Blim, I wouldn't take Aftermath damage and I'd be fine. It would be low odds, but I wouldn't have to level up so much. Unfortunately, that ship has sailed. And so, yeah, I just had to spend a very long time. Thankfully, we do have the Versus Seeker, so we don't just have to rely on wild Pokemon. We can rebattle various trainers ones that do give us some good experience points. So it doesn't take as long as you think. Also, remember, we are in the fluctuating group and we're out of the early game. So comparatively, we're actually leveling up much quicker. And yeah, once we get to level 59, the battle requires no commentary. It's just one KO Shadow Ball, which is a special move. And even though my special attack is terrible, I'm at a high enough level that it one KOs the Drift Blim. And then, what? Oh, never mind. I figured out what happened there. So, Buizel has Swift Swim. It is raining on this route. So, even though I'm more than double its level and it's a pre evolved Pokemon, it is able to outspeed me. And boy, did I ever get lucky because typically I would save before a battle like this and once I've already reached level 59. But because I was so frustrated with how much time it was taking, I thought, well, I'll just save right before and I'll level up after I knock out Gligar. So I still have Shadow Sneak. Even though I deleted it the first time, I can delete Confuse Ray. Yes, I would like to have Confuse Ray, but the other moves are far more necessary. I can't reteach either Shadow Claw or yet Return. So that's what I opted to do. And we were able to beat the Weasel. And man. This run truly is fascinating and unique because 
it seems completely almost random which trainers are going to be easy and which are going to be difficult. And on the easy side, we have Maylin. Now, it shouldn't be all that surprising considering fighting type Pokemon typically don't have moves that could hit Shedinja, and I'm more than double the level of most Pokemon. Shadow Claw easily won a KO's Metatite, and Machoke didn't stand much of a chance. However, Lucario does resist. Ghost was resisted by Steel up until Generation 7, I believe, or 6? Not important, Lucario can't actually hit me with anything. You see it tries for Force Palm, and alright, that is four gym badges, and we are already at a level higher most times than we finish the game in a lot of my runs. So yeah, unique run so far. But as is the case always in this run, you're never out of the woods. We have a mandatory double battle where we team up with Dawn to defeat a couple Team Galactic Grunts, and... They can use Confuse Ray or Bite, it's two Zubat to start with, and they have one more Pokemon each. But man, this battle, this is annoying because Clefairy doesn't like to cooperate, and it just adds a whole bunch more of randomness. It took me a really long time to figure out a consistent strategy. And in the end, I had to teach Shedinja Protect. Clefairy will always go for Gravity on turn one, and then you needed to use Sing on turn two, I went for Protect again, 50-50 chance of it working. If it doesn't work, just reset. If it does and Sing hits, then you knock out the Zubat that is not asleep. The next Pokemon is a Stunky. You need Zubat left not to wake up. If it does, you pretty much lose. Clefairy can help you out with Metronome, but in this case, it does not at all. Just more randomness, hooray. Thankfully though, once Stunky is knocked out, it's only one Pokemon on the opponent's side, and we outspeed. So we can easily get by, but unfortunately I ended up resetting and I hadn't saved before this battle. And my win rate's about like, I don't know, under 10%. Very, very frustrating. And because of it being a mandatory double battle, there is very little I can do to control it. Wonder what a run of double battles would look like. That'd be something I should probably look into. But anyway, we still have to finish this run. And oh yeah, why did I have to reset? Well, let's talk about that. You'll notice Protect is in the same spot that Shadow Ball was in. I'm not really using Shadow Ball, so it didn't seem to make much of a difference. But Psychic Abigail, just to the south of Veilstone City, has a Drifloon. But remember how I said once we got to Veilstone we had options? Well, introducing the move that I've never used, but is going to be helpful, Natural Gift. Yes, it knocks out Drifloon, and let's explain how this move works. It is truly bizarre. Natural Gift only works if you're holding a berry. It uses that berry to do physical damage that does not deal contact, which literally couldn't be more perfect. So it's like a hidden power you can choose the type of based on what berry you use. And here is the chart. Different berries do different power, and it actually was buffed in later generations. I have literally never seen this move used ever. It's a one-time use only per battle, because it consumes the berry. But, it can be useful like knocking out Drifloon, and potentially knocking out Pokemon that Shedinja doesn't really have good moves for. So it's going to be very helpful, and we can buy it from the Pokemart. So if I ever have to replace it, I can just teach it over and over again. Not going to lie, I love when I get to use moves that I've never used in my entire life. It always makes me smile. But you know what didn't make me smile? This battle with Crasher Wake. Like with the rival, his first Pokemon, Gyarados, uses Intimidate and Bye Bye Shedinja. So yeah, that's not looking good. That is not just one level up. What am I going to do? Yikes. Oh, I know. How about Electrified Natural Gift? That will surely one it KO the Gyarados. Next comes out Floatzel, we're going to use Shadow Claw! Oh, that didn't knock it out. And it knows Crunch. Uh, that's not looking good. But you know what? Shadow Claw was doing enough damage. Maybe it's a range. Maybe I can get a crit. Let's keep trying again and again and again. And see if we can end up knocking out that Floatzel with Shadow Claw. Eventually, I do get a battle where I knock out the Floatzel and I didn't need a critical hit. So it is a range. Probably a 1 in 16 chance, which is terrible odds. But... Anyway, it didn't actually matter. 
Quagsire is similarly bulky to Gyarados, so it also didn't want to KO to a Shadow Claw, and it knows Rock Tomb. So, yeah. Let's level up. Alright, so I ran some errands, got some TMs, now I'm at level 66. Let's try this again. Alright, will we knock out the Gyarados? Yes! With a critical hit. Okay, very good. Now we definitely should knock out Floatzel. Critical hit doesn't matter. But uh-oh, are we going to knock out Quagsire? Yes, we are! With Natural Gift. You see, my plan was actually to try for a critical hit against Gyarados, because it's very easy to reset. Yeah, I guess I would be going for a bit of a lucky strategy, and because I was planning for the critical hit against Gyarados for the faster reset, I could use a grass-based natural gift for Quagsire, easy one to KO. And so while you might think the leveling up didn't matter, it actually did, because it made Floatzel an automatic one to KO. Yes, I ended up getting a crit anyway, but I didn't need one is the point. And consistency, even when using a lucky strategy, it's what I like to see. And now we have to battle a Team Galactic Grunt, which leads off with a Crow Gunk and uses Sucker Punch, and I lose. And this is not going to be the last one to use Sucker Punch. The AI in Generation 4 doesn't have automatic good AI. If you remember Generation 1, they prefer super effective moves like Sucker Punch, but they won't always use it. So against Grunts with Sucker Punch, I just reset till I don't get it. I could teach a status move and try and stall out their Sucker Punches, but because they don't always use Sucker Punch, there's a chance they could use another move, and they do have other moves that can damage me, so really just resetting and going for Shadow Claw, that's what I end up doing. Mildly annoying, I feel like I should bring it up because it really was a source of irritation, because oftentimes I'd encounter a Crow Gunk, having not saved for a while, and then either having to backtrack or resetting, it was annoying. But after losing 15 minutes of footage after my recording software crashed, and thankfully it no longer corrupts, I just lose the footage after it crashes. So that was only 15 minutes of footage and a reset, still frustrating, but we finally make it to Byron, Rourke's father and the steel type gym leader. Always thought that was kind of cute. I have the rock type, but then you have the steel type. But for our purposes, steel type is actually easier to deal with. The only Pokemon that can hit me with attacks is Bastiodon, so I decide to go for a Shadow Claw just in case one of them would survive a single dig. So it swaps into Steelix, but before it can even attack, it swaps again into Bastiodon. Dig is quadruple super effective, so it will easily knock out Bastiodon. Then comes out Steelix, I go for Dig, and uh-oh. Darude is quaking, because we got a Sandstorm. And, uh, remember how I said anything that deals damage knocks out Shedinja? Well, Sandstorm goes from mildly irritating to literally the most scary move ever. So, yeah, how am I gonna deal with that? Natural Gift. Let me show you. So this time, I'm gonna anticipate the swap, and rather than use Shadow Claw, I'm gonna use Natural Gift. I've equipped into Bad Berry, which is Water-type damage. 70 base power it does not quite knock it out, but I'm hoping it's dealt enough damage that Shadow Claw can knock it out. Once again, we're going to find out later, swaps into Bastiodon. I'm going to go for Dig and knock out the Bastiodon. All right, will Shadow Claw knock out? No, uh-oh. And remember how I said Natural Gift is a one-time use move? The only thing I can really do is go for Dig, and yep, Sandstorm. So, time for a new strategy. This time I equip a Chesto Berry, which is a 60 base power water move. Hopefully, this does enough damage that Shadow Claw will knock it out, but not so much damage that it heals. Byron seems to be doing the exact same thing, which is super, super helpful, because not every Pokemon game works like this. Or really, I guess it depends on the battle, but regardless, Steelix is now out. The moment of truth. Does Shadow Claw do enough damage? Yes! Very good. Magneton can't actually hit us. So, after knocking it out, however we choose, multiple Shadow Claws, dig, whatever, it'll work. We have six gym badges, albeit we are literally double the level of the Pokemon we are facing, but hey, I'm gonna take some amount of pride. This has been pretty difficult and time consuming. And I'm not sure if our run is actually over, because now we have to go to Route 216. And although this trainer I'm going to show is not mandatory, there is one that is. And 216 has Hail. Hail is a mild inconvenience, but like Sandstorm to Shedinja, it is a one-hit KO. And if a trainer has more than two Pokémon, 
Shedinja will lose. And the run is over. Or is it? I mean, again, that last trainer we could skip. But this is the mandatory battle with multiple Pokemon, Ace Trainer Dalton. And thankfully, he leads with a Pokemon, Electabuzz, which cannot attack us. Because we can set up sunny days. Chasing that hail away. Shadow Claw. See, we need to have Sesame Street references in every single Pokemon video. And uh, seriously though, Sunny Day, the savior of the Shedinja run, a move you would never use on a Shedinja. And thank goodness we can get more natural gifts because that's what I replaced, but the trainer ends up being trivial. I believe there's only one more trainer that's mandatory, Ace Trainer Olivia, that has two Pokemon or more, and thankfully, she leads off with Curlia, which can't attack. So thankfully, the spot I thought could end the run ended up not doing so. For the record, if one of the Pokemon could hit us, I had a backup plan. You can get a Focus Sash. It's near where the Pal Park is. There's an NPC and he says, oh, show me a Pokemon at this level. And if you do that three different times, he will give you a Focus Sash. So I was prepared for this to take several weeks if I needed to wait that long, but it didn't. We were able to do this, and uh, if I need a Focus Sash later, now you know how I'll be able to get it. But for now, let's skip ahead and battle Candice. What's that? What's that, 12-year-old me? It's pronounced Candice? No, not every Candice spells their name with an A, and even though it's a pun on ice, it's still pronounced Candice? Okay, sure, let's battle Candice. She leads with Sneasel. Thankfully, we outspeed and return. Does one hit KO, that's one down. Next, we have Frostlass, Shadow Claw will be super effective, and not very surprising, another 1 hit KO. Now, I don't know if Piloswine will be a 1 hit KO. Okay, it is. Very good, that is 3 down. And we're very lucky, because since Snow doesn't have actually moves to hit us with, it's going to be the last Pokemon Candice uses. And so even though it has Snow Warning, which automatically whips up a Hailstorm, Shadow Claw, 1 hit KOs. I could have used Natural Gift if I had to, but we did not. And we have beaten Candice. Seven gyms in hand. This game seems to be at our command. For anyone who actually got that reference, I apologize. Anyway, we have a little bit of boring stuff, I guess. Just like in actually most of the games, this is where the villain team story wraps up. And I do want to mention the final battle with Cyrus because this was the first battle. Just need to get a little bit further. Weavile outsped me. No item, no swift swim. It just outsped. And there's a couple different things I could do about this, actually. One of them is just level up, although I'm getting pretty close to level 100, so that will stop working. The other is I can get the Quick Claw. It's just available from an NPC, and it gives me a 20% chance to go first. In the end, though, I just decide to level up, and I equip the Quick Law anyway, just in case I don't want to speed the rest of the Pokemon. Otherwise, the battle went pretty well, and we can move on to the 8th and final gym, Volkner. And he's, uh, pretty easy. <laughs> the only two Pokemon that can hit me are Luxray and Electivire. I quickly dispatch of Luxray with a return. Electivire, I think about it, then I realize, eh, I don't know if it'll win a KO, might as well use Dig. It'll waste a little bit of time, but certainly it's going to work, and yeah, I mean, that's the battle. Pretty anticlimactic for the 8th gym. To be fair, we're kind of used to the 8th gym not being too bad. However, the most difficult part of the game is seemingly yet to come. We have one final rival battle. This time, the rival battle actually happens just before you enter the Elite Four Chambers. And it doesn't go all that well. You see, even at level 95, Return does not one hit KO Staraptor. Very, very close, but it doesn't. But don't worry, we can level up a little bit more and it'll be fine, right? We could do that or we could just use Natural Gift and get rid of Staraptor that way. Shadow Claw, one hit KOs Floatzel, I'm going to use Dig, and that is 100% going to 1 KO Infernape. Shadow Claw knocks out Rose Raid. And... Oh. Well, that's, uh, that's 
not good. Well, I tried a whole bunch of different stuff, but in the end, I just leveled up. And once you do that, return one Akeo Star Raptor, and Shadow Claw will one Akeo everything else, but I do have the Spell Tag equipped, which boosts my Ghost moves by 20%, which, combined with my extra leveling, does do enough to one Akeo Heracross. Unfortunately, that is only Pokemon number 5. We still have the Snorlax, and we don't come even close to knocking it out. So, we just have to hope for a crit. Yep, that was the strat in the end. And that's really all I can do. I thought about it, and I can't even teach any new moves. I need all the moves I have. I need Return for Star Raptor. I need Shadow Claw for everything else. And I need Dig for Flint of the Elite Four. And you'll notice I haven't deleted Sunny Day just in case something else uses a weather move. And if I delete Sunny Day, that could make the whole run impossible. So, I just have to hope for a crit. It's a 6% chance, but whatever, it is what it is. If you reset enough times, eventually you'll get it. Finally, after we've defeated the rival, we can take on the Elite Four. And we start off with the Bug Trainer, Eren. And there's only one Pokemon I'm worried about, Scizor. Scizor, I mean, Dig might knock it out, but I could just teach Natural Gift. I don't think I'm going to use Return anymore. So now that I've defeated the last Star Raptor, I can delete Return and teach Natural Gift. And let's see if that works. All right, starts off with the Enmega, Shadow Claw. That's one down. Vespaquen, two. Yeah, that works. Now we have Drapion. It could theoretically hit me, but I'm going to go for Dig. And because it's super effective, it's going to knock it out. Natural Gift with a fire-inducing berry will obviously knock out Scizor, and now Heracross, that's the question, will it 1 KO without the spell tag? Yes, maybe, critical hit, I don't know. Either way, first try victory against Eren, but now we've got Bertha, whose Pokemon come from the Eartha, that's the pun. And most of her Pokemon can't actually do anything, but some of them can, and eh, let's just try and see how it goes. All right, she starts off with Whiskash. This can't actually do anything, so I'm gonna go for Shadow Claw, and she immediately swaps into Gliscor. Now, we do enough damage that I think Gliscor is gonna heal. Yes, it does heal, and when you're dealing over half damage, that's not really a problem, because she will run out of full restores eventually. It appears she actually only has one, so all that did is delay the inevitable. Now, I equipped one of the berries that gives me a Grass-type attack for Golem, so Natural Gift will knock it out, but I'm not sure if Dig will want to KO Rhyperior. Rock Wrecker misses, and... Okay, oh, crit, so I'm not sure still. Lots of questions, but we only have two Pokemon left. So here comes Whiskash again, I'm gonna go for Shadow Claw, and uh-oh. She swaps into, is it Hippowdon or Hippowdon? I don't know, I always said Hippowdon. I, I used to say Hippodon, but there's a W there. Doesn't really matter what you call it because it has the ability Sandstream, meaning automatic sandstorm, meaning I lose. So that's great, but obviously not a big deal. We can just try again. I should mention that I battle Eren a couple of times. I figure out that Dig will not reliably want to KO Scizor, so Natural Gift is the correct strategy, and Shadow Claw does reliably want to KO Heracross, so the battle is very consistent, which is good. But now, let's see if we can beat Bertha. I do have an idea of what I want to do. I'm going to equip the spell tag. My hope is that 20% increase will do enough damage to knock out the Hippowdon and probably the Gliscor. Let's see. So, we get Whiskash first. Swaps into Gliscor. Good to see that's consistent. And we knock out Gliscor in one hit. Very good. Now, I have to use Dig for Golem because I don't have a bear to use Natural Gift. Will Dig knock it out? It does! Very good! Okay, so Golem is down. Rhyperior we knocked out, but it was a critical hit. Hopefully that didn't... matter... uh-oh. Well, that's not good. And it used a rock move to absolutely wreck me, so... It looks like that's not going to work with my attack. That's very annoying. Just a little bit more attack and it would have worked, but I have an idea. Shedinja can learn Giga Drain, and Giga Drain, being a grass move and a special move, even though my special is pretty bad, 
It is super effective. It should want to KO both Pokemon so I can keep my spell tag equipped and I probably will be able to knock out both. Let's see. All right, Whiskash into Gly... That's not Gliscor. What? No. What? She'll switch into Hippowdon? No, that's not supposed to happen. Be consistent. Ah, oh, gosh. All right, hopefully that was just a one-off. Let's try one more time. All right, here's Whiskash and Gliscor. So 75% of the time, based on our four attempts, we get Gliscor. That's good. Of course, I was nervous, so I went for Sunny Day, but that's not a big deal. Since we do have the spell tag equipped, Shadow Claw will want to KO Gliscor. So really going for Sunny Day is no risk and potential reward of not losing. So that's kind of nice. Anyway, Gliscor is down. Now we're going to use Giga Drain against Golem. Unsurprisingly, it's a 1 KO. Now we have Rhyperior. Come on. No! What is with this? Oh, gosh. Oh, that's really bad. I don't know what to do now. And to be honest, I'm not even sure if Spell Tag Shadow Claw won it KOs. So I decided to switch strategies, and I used the Soft Sand instead of the Spell Tag. Hippodon doesn't come out second often at all, so that didn't really make much of a difference. And with the Soft Sand, both Golem and Rhyperior were consistent one at KOs. When it comes to Hippodon, I'm actually extremely lucky. If she just swapped in Hippodon, that would be really, really problematic. And winning this battle would require extreme luck. Thankfully, because she decides to go to Whiskash again, then Hippodon, I can set up a sunny day and then hope I either get a Stone Edge miss or a critical hit. And obviously you could tell by my inflection I got the Stone Edge miss. And I can defeat Hippodon. Whiskash can't actually attack me, so I can win. And now you see why I held on to Sunny Day. I wasn't sure if I would need it against this Hippodon, and I did. So if I deleted it, this battle would have pretty much been impossible. Think about it. Even if I won a KO Hippodon, and a Focus Sash doesn't work against weather damage. So, yeah, we're pretty lucky things worked out the way they are. However, we're not out of the woods yet. We still have three more trainers. Funny enough, Flint is going to be extremely easy. You wouldn't think so, but the massive caveat is so long as we outspeed, which I think we do, we should be able to use Dig and want to KO every single one of Flint's Pokemon. So, outspeed Houndoom. Okay, that's going to easily want to KO. If we outspeed Houndoom, we're going to outspeed Flareon and obviously want to KO. Rapidash is pretty fast. It has Rapid in its name, but we outspeed. Very good. And obviously another one a KO. Magmortar is at a pretty high level, but I'm not worried about Dig one a KOing. And Infernape, will we outspeed? Yes. Okay. So, thank goodness we outsped. I wasn't as careful with my speed EVs, so it was possible I could lose. But while I was potentially worried about Flint, I'm not worried at all about our next trainer. And in fact, now that we have defeated Bertha, I can delete Sunny Day and teach X-Scissor because we're actually about to face the Psychic type trainer. And uh, once I restore my power points because gotta make sure we have enough Shadow Claws. Also, might as well equip the Spell Tag. Not a bad idea to do that. We should have a pretty easy time against Lucian. Not sure what the pun is there, but whatever. Anyway, we're gonna use Shadow Claw. He switches into Gallade, and that didn't matter. Critical hit didn't matter either. Now we have an Espeon. We outspeed even Espeon. All right, that's pretty good. Now we have Mr. Mime, and now Mr. Mime is no more. And Bronzong, I don't think I'll want to KO, but it can't actually damage me, so we're fine. And we got a crit anyway, so we're very fine. And that was the Lance of this Elite Four. Yes, that was number four. We have made it to Cynthia, the trickiest champion, some say. And I think that's pretty fair. Very balanced team, great Pokemon. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to go. Not at all. But 
There's not very much I can really do at this point. Might as well just see how it goes. Now our first Pokemon is extremely scary. There is no weakness I can exploit. I'm going to go for X Scissor, which is slightly more powerful. And yes. Okay. Spirit Tomb. That was the one I was most concerned with. One it KO. Togekiss is also pretty bulky. So I'm going to go for Shadow. Oh my. Oh, what was I doing? No. So for those of you who don't understand what just happened there, as of Generation 6, Togekiss is not a normal flying type. It is a fairy flying type. And you know, fairy has been around long enough and I played enough competitive Pokemon that I completely forgot Togekiss was normal. And so a bug move wouldn't have worked. Natural gift, I didn't have a berry. I had nothing for Togekiss. And that means because of my no saving between Elite Four rule, I have to start all the way back at the beginning with Eren, and I have to do that Bertha lottery all over again. And I realized, you know what? We're going to suspend the no saving rule because that rule exists primarily to stop luck-based strategies. Well, that's all well and good, but when I'm going to use a luck-based strategy against Bertha, aka hope Hippodon doesn't come out second, or hope I get a miss slash critical hit. Yeah, I think we're dealing with a luck-based strategy, and I'm at level 100. Can't level up anymore. Potentially, I could have tried Sunny Day Solar Beam combo. I didn't want to try that. I don't know. This, I just knew would work. So eventually, obviously, I just save in front of Bertha. But if you can believe it, the battle I save in front of her, of course, is the battle I win. And overall, this is my 15th attempt. And I count an attempt every time I reset. So that's really not too bad. Hilariously enough, I got the less likely Stone Edge miss since there's a 50-50 chance for Crunch. That's only approximately 10% chance that happens. But hey, I'll take it. And so we have defeated Bertha again. The next two Elite Four members, I am not worried about whatsoever. So while I show off those battles, Let's talk about my thoughts for Cynthia. If I don't keep the spell tag equipped, I do have a Pomeg Berry, and that will give me a 70 base power ice attack, which I can use against Togekiss. The question is, will I be able to 1-KO the rest of her Pokemon, or will I have to rely on potentially getting a critical hit, especially against Garchomp? Thus far, I'm, I'm really not sure. And while you think saving would make this less nerve-wracking, it's actually the opposite. Because now I'm locked in. If I screwed up, if I actually can't beat Cynthia without having to leave the Elite Four, I can't get Sunny Day back, and I've made this impossible. I can either beat her with what I've got, or I have to give up, and I've done that before. I have a Beldum run in Emerald that I messed up, and I couldn't complete it. I know it's completable, or should be, but I'd messed up with saving. And it's another reason I don't like to save in between. Having said that, it is literally too late to turn back now. Let's try Cynthia, take two. First things first, is X Scissor a guaranteed one to KO? Yes, that's very good. Okay, one thing we know for sure now. Now we're going to use our natural gift against Togekiss. I wish I could use this multiple times. Would be great against Garchomp. And we do knock out Togekiss in one hit. But here's the moment of truth. Do we knock out the level 62 Garchomp? I go for X Scissor, my most powerful attack. No, we don't. And Flamethrower cannot miss. So, yeah. So far, though, this isn't that bad. All we need is a Shadow Claw critical hit. It is a 12% chance. So, and darn it, there's no way to decrease the counter, but this is the next attempt. You could see I didn't edit anything here. So let's just try one more time. We have Spirit Tomb, still one a KO, very good. We have Togekiss, still one a KO, good again. All right, now can we get the 12% critical hit chance with Shadow Claw? Yes, we can, okay, that was quick. And uh, I don't know if we won or not, but that was definitely good to see. All right, Lucario is next. I think Dig will win a KO. It can hit me with Shadow Ball, as you saw, but not when I'm underground. And unsurprisingly, Lucario is knocked out. 
Next up is Rose Raid. We've already seen that Rose Raid doesn't have great defense, and I have X Scissor, and we won. My Lotic can't actually damage me. That's it. Doesn't matter if I want to KO or not. My Lotic does not have a move to hit Shedinja. I seriously thought this one would actually be impossible. I thought Bertha would be impossible. I thought the Hail would be impossible. But we persevered. And uh, wow. You know, this was really fun. It really was. It could be frustrating at points. But I really miss Generation 4. It was so much fun to do a run in a game I haven't done before. I love Gen 1, don't get me wrong. But I'm really excited to try these challenges in other generations. And that's kind of all I have to say about this. Very interesting, unique type of run. And I'm glad we were able to pull it off. And I'll see you guys in a few days with another new video. Take care.